This lecture is coming to you from the UC San Diego Hospital. Definitely not the most ideal place to record an online lecture, but uh, it is necessary and it is what it is. I think the takeaway here is that all places are good places to talk about art. Now, this is a lecture on methodology, and methodology is kind of like a plan. It's a uh, specific strategy that an art historian will take to um, analyze and interpret a work of art. So we don't just come in and just sort of like look at it and say here's our interpretation. We kind of make a plan. And there's a lot of methodologies in art. Uh, maybe half a dozen, maybe ten, I don't know. A lot. And um, there's many to choose from. Now the good news is for this class is we're only going to look at a few. Uh, the ones that really best relate to what we're going to be studying. Now I'm particularly excited to record this online lecture because we are going to talk about my two most favorite methodologies which are iconography and feminist critical theory. Now, these are particularly helpful methodologies for us to use when we are uh, studying the ancient world because in the ancient world there is a lack of reliable text documentation. Even when we are looking at historical societies that do have the written word, we do want to take this written word with a grain of salt. Um, think about the motivations behind the writing, who wrote it, uh, those sorts of things, particularly as it is relating to gender. Now when we look at feminist critical thinking, a lot of people think that, oh, this is just about like women or female power or that sort of thing, and that's really not accurate. Feminism is concerned with gender. And so we do, I do like to use feminist critical theory in the interpretation of art because it gives us a sense of the way that both femininity and masculinity are communicated through art, right, gender. Now iconography, iconography is a methodology that has to do with symbolism and uh, basically it's this idea that you can look at images in a work of art and that they have a symbolic potential. Now what I think is most helpful in this class is to combine all three of these methodologies and that's definitely allowed. I personally think that there's no one methodology that's going to address all your interpretive needs when you're trying to figure out what a work of art is trying to communicate. Throw in a little formal analysis, look at potential for symbolism, and then because a lot of what we look at in this class depicts people, um, feminism, feminist critical theory can help to understand uh, gender and the way that gender is fitting in with society or politics or religion or uh, culture, all of the things. We're going to look at the, kind of do a little comparison. We have the Victory Stele of Naram Sin and this should be familiar to you. This is a detail of the stele that we were looking at when we did our formal analysis, which you may or may not have watched yet, the uh, formal analysis methodology video. Here's a detail though of our Mesopotamian king and we're going to compare this to an image of a uh, Egyptian pharaoh. What's interesting is this is actually a female pharaoh. One of the few pharaohs, uh, one of three women who had the title pharaoh ancient Egypt. But it had Shepset who we see here, she was the longest lasting of the female pharaohs ruling over Egypt for something like 20, 25 years. Now, it's kind of hard to tell what we're looking at, and this is where our iconographical analysis comes in, symbolism, okay? So let's take a look at how these images are communicating political power. First of all, Okay, let's take a look at, let's start at the top and work our way down. You can see that in both of these images that the uh, figure is wearing a very interesting hat. This is always an important clue when we're trying to interpret ancient artwork. If they're wearing something on their head, 
likely that is significant. These actually here are horns, and this is going to indicate that we are looking at uh, a, a divine being. Now, as I had mentioned, though, this is a king. And so basically what these horns are symbolizing is that not only are we looking at a king, but this king is actually conceiving of himself as a god, uh, which is a pretty bold claim, but he's going to go there uh, because it's very important during this period, the Akkad period, for um, kings to communicate high levels of power because there was so much warfare and political strife at this time. How can you argue with or challenge somebody who's saying, well, I'm pretty much a god? So it's a pretty smart political strategy, I think, and it's a time-honored one. We're going to see this this entire semester. Rulers trying to convey power by associating themselves with deities. Now, this isn't a different uh, headdress, but definitely this is one that um, is also conveying power. This headdress actually is the headdress of uh, Lower Egypt. Basically what it is, is it's this little uh, like swirly thing coming out of this sort of square-like headdress. This actually is meant to be a representation of a cobra that's coiling out of a basket. It's meant to represent the uh, power of the, the, the pharaoh, the, the power that a cobra has if it like, jumps out of the basket and it's going to bite you and kill you. Basically, that's what this headdress is representing. Lower Egypt is one of the two regions of Egypt, Upper and Lower Egypt, which uh, we begin pharaonic history, the first pharaoh, with the combination of Upper and Lower Egypt. This headdress is showing that Hatshepsut is a pharaoh and that Hatshepsut rules over Lower Egypt. Now, what else we see is we see here the false beard. And these are fake beards that they would wear attached to their chin from behind the ears. The beard is a representation also of pharaonic power. And so what would happen is, is they would wear these beards, they would wear these headdresses, and um, people would come in, they'd see these symbols of power and know that they were addressing the pharaoh. Now think about what a beard might symbolize. Why a beard to show power? Well, beard is, it's masculine, right? And if you think about stereotypical notions of masculinity, we can see a beard here as well, a beautiful, big, bushy beard. This idea of, you know, stereotypical masculinity is men are powerful, men are strong, men are aggressive. And again, these are stereotypes, but if you are someone who's trying to communicate a sense of power, think about that. You would want to be seen as strong and aggressive and, uh, you know, all of the things. And so this, uh, these masculine associations are now projected onto um, political power. It's quite effective. Now the other thing that we can see is we can see that they actually are wearing similar clothing. There's a lot of similarities um, that we see between Egyptian and Mesopotamian art. There was a lot of cultural exchange. In both of these instances, they're wearing a short kilt. And the short kilt also can represent uh, the pharaoh. It can also represent the military because these uh, kilts are worn in war because it allows for mobility. You can move around, your legs are unrestrained. So it kind of is a representation of action or movement to show that in both of these cases, these kings are um, actively ruling over their, their territory. They're not just like sitting on a throne or hanging out in a tent, but they're actually moving around and they're, they're ruling. Now, um, what I think is really interesting, and I haven't ever seen scholarship address this, and I think it's something that should be addressed, is this panel that hangs down. It's in a very curious place to me, sort of hanging down vertically between the legs. Uh, I don't know. It just kind of reminds me of male genitalia, and I think that that's not a coincidence. Uh, there's no such things as coincidences in life or art, and I think that this is meant to be kind of like a phallic symbol, a sort of representation yet again for masculinity. Interestingly enough, we've got something that's hanging down right here as well. So I think that's an additional uh, reference to masculinity. You'll notice that actually we see their position the same with the left foot forward. And this is actually um, referred to by scholars as the masculine left foot forward, again, denoting this idea of action, of, of moving. And this is again kind of going along with some, stereo some stereotypes with gender. 
uh, this idea of, um, you know, men are active, they're out in the public sphere, moving around, doing stuff where women are inactive, they stay at home, uh, and they don't really participate in things outside of the domestic sphere. Now, other points of iconography, uh, you know, you can look at things like, for example, weapons. Weapons can be viewed as iconography, as symbols. They represent war, they represent dominance, aggression. Um, you know, we kind of, anything that we can sort of relate to warfare, definitely appropriate in terms of symbolism. Now, um, Hatshepsut, she's not holding um, weapons, but she's holding these sort of you know, accoutrements, these sort of objects that are representing uh, power as well. This right here is the flail. It's a shepherd's tool, um, and this has to do with rulership as well. It's affiliated with the god Osiris. So the god Osiris was uh, a shepherd, and uh, so this is a way to sort of affiliate herself uh, with the gods. Now, in terms of, so, you know, we, so we just did an iconographical analysis. We looked at all these symbols that are communicating all these different notions of uh, political power, linking political power to masculinity, linking political power to being actively present in this, you know, this role of king, linking political power to uh, the military. And uh, now we, we look at some, some feminist critical theory and it's appropriate that we kind of go in this direction because we do have these symbols that are communicating masculinity. It does sort of encourage us to think about gender. And I think maybe what the most curious thing of all is this idea that we're looking at a female. But if you were looking at this and you didn't know that Hatshepsut was a woman, you would not make that kind of distinction based on what you're seeing here in terms of anatomy. We don't see breasts. We don't see a build that is more of what we'd expect of a woman. There's some musculature. This is where our, where, you know, our feminist analysis comes from. Why do we see this? And basically the sort of takeaway here is that in ancient Egypt, also in Mesopotamia, and I think actually in pretty much every culture, and I even would make an argument that it exists even today, is this idea that political power is a concept that is inherently masculine. So even though Hatshepsut's a woman, because she is a king, a pharaoh, she's being presented in masculine terms, because this is what was something that was conceptually recognizable to the people of Egypt. These images of kings, these were not meant to be like portraits, like who is Hatshepsut, you know, what, what are her likes, dislikes, what does she like to do on the weekend? Nobody cares. These are images that are, say she is a king, she is powerful. They're not meant to be accurate representations of what people look like. So much of their individual identity is erased that even gender is no longer important. She's a king that is masculine in concept, so she is depicted as a man. Let's do one other um, example of iconography as well as feminist critical theory. And let's take a look at this stele of Hegesso. Now this is a, um, a grave stele. Okay, so this is a grave marker, kind of like our tombstones of today, but this has this very beautiful sculpture on the front. Let's start with some iconography. What are some things that could be symbolic here? Now, what we're looking at is we're looking at a woman who is seated. She has what is probably a servant that's bringing her jewels, and she's looking at her jewels, okay? This would be a really important point of iconographical analysis, what this is symbolize. Now, we can talk about this idea of it being symbolic of wealth, and I think that that's really uh, a good, a good uh, determination. Obviously, this woman is wealthy. Not every Athenian woman is going to have the privilege of such a lovely stele over their grave. So we can see that this is a wealthy woman. Now, another thing that we can think about is this idea that perhaps this is um, looking at wealth, but maybe the, the temporary nature of wealth, that when we die, we don't get to take our wealth with us. And so maybe it's this idea of contemplating 
the impermanence of life, the temporary nature of life. We call these, and you don't have to write this word down, but we call these type of images vanitas images, this idea of the transience of life and the transience of beauty and time and this idea that nothing lasts forever. And so this could certainly be an expression of wealth, but it very well could be a contemplation of the temporary nature of life. We see the presence of the girl here also as a representation of wealth as well. The beautiful hairstyle, this lovely garment. So clearly a lot of the symbols are here as a way to represent wealth. To comment on the identity of this woman, and perhaps she's hoping that this status will somehow transcend this earthly realm and she will be able to retain this status in the afterlife. Now, Let's take a look at uh, some gender-based ideas here. If you look at the frame, there's this architectural frame, which almost looks as if they're sitting indoors, and then she's sitting on this chair. So this tends to be this indoor scene. Now, the reason why I'm pointing this out, and we kind of talked about this in the previous slide, is this idea of the sort of spatial domain of genders within the ancient world. And of course, there's ex exceptions to this. So there's a little bit of a, a generalization happening right now. But this idea that, again, women are more typically constrained to the domestic realm. And so we have this woman and she's shown within the domestic space that typically would be where she would occupy. And again, women not only were sort of constrained to the domestic space, but they really were seen as sort of the, that was their, the place they were in charge of. So this woman is conveying this sense of status, a status within the domestic realm, within her home. Typically, it was women who were in charge of overseeing the servants. The status is also being um, alluded to with the jewelry. Think about this idea of, you know, jewelry, right? It was women that typically wear jewelry that adorn their bodies with that. And so we have this comment on femininity with this idea of, of uh, beauty and wearing necklaces to sort of accentuate that, that beauty. Jewelry is a really important part of uh, a female gender expression, and that's being alluded to here. Now, I put in here, let's add in some formal analysis. Is there anything that we can see here in terms of formal analysis that might back up some of these interpretations that I'm making, particularly in terms of communicating status? What we're seeing here actually is hierarchical scale. And it's a tricky one, but we're going to commonly see this hierarchical scale a lot in this class. She's seated. Her servant comes and stands in front of her. Now, if you think about it, typically if you sit and someone approaches you and stands in front of you, they're going to be taller than you. Even if you're an adult and they're a young person like this, they still would be taller than you. They'd, they'd sort of loom over you. So this is hierarchical scale. Her size is enlarged to the extent that she's so large in size that even if you come up and stand in front of her, she's going to be the same size as someone standing. So that can be uh, a way to convey power. She certainly is the focal point. We can talk about emphasis. She's the focal point. We have implied lines with the gaze here as well. That leads uh, to, to the viewer focusing um, on this person as well. And so we do kind of combine these three methodologies, iconography, feminist critical theory, and formal analysis to make this conclusion that we're looking at a steely, a grave marker of a woman who uh, was powerful and is communicating this power in a myriad of ways.